Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Our guest today is Nilifer Merchant, a top-ranked business thinker, also known as the Jane Bond of innovation, who's advised on a plethora of startups. Previously, she's had executive stints at corporate 500 companies, including Apple and Autodesk. In addition, she's an in-demand TED speaker and the author of several books, including her latest, The Power of Onlyness. Nilifer, thanks so much for stopping by to talk about your latest book. I'm so glad to be here, Tracy. Can you explain the concept of your book, The Power of Onlyness, and how your upbringing and family values helped you discover your unique onlyness? So onlyness is a term I coined in 2011, 2012. It's pointing to the fact that each of us create value from that spot in the world only you stand. But for thousands of years, a bunch of our onlys didn't get to count. But now in this distributed networked world, you can actually find the other people who care about the same things as you and make those seemingly wild ideas that only you have into reality. And so that's what the idea was. It was originally to try to capture an economic innovation uh, trend that I saw. And then your second question was, was interesting is like, how did I come to it? I suspect it's, it's my own life experience has been very much being seen through the lens of who I was by a category. So when I was young and uh, participating in my family, I was seen as a, a good Muslim girl. And a good Muslim girl's uh, responsibility was to marry well, not necessarily aspire for something for themselves. And then later on in my life, I was an admin at Apple and got seen through the lens of sort of, you know, here's your status inside the organization and therefore here's your job and how many ideas you're allowed to have and so on and so on. A lot of us face this. If you're super young, you get told you can't possibly know enough. Maybe if you're older, you get told, well, you're outdated in this industry. There's all sorts of ways in which people are viewed through the isms mm -hmm. instead of what is it that you can distinctly offer the world? Uh, and that's why I think I came to this idea of just noticing that there's a way for all of us to add value. Can you share some secret successes to inspire our viewers that happened to you along the way and helped you again to write this fabulous book? I think one of the experiences was, it's actually the story I start the book with, mm -hmm. uh, which is a story of, uh, I got raised in a very traditional household and uh, so traditional that I was supposed to grow up and have an arranged marriage. And I didn't want that. Well, I didn't not want it. I wanted to make my family happy, but I also wanted an education. And at some point, it came to a head where like, the, it had been arranged, the marriage had been arranged. And I said, yeah, but did you ask him if I could also get an education? They said, no, we didn't want to negotiate for that because we were negotiating for a house. We didn't want to put too much you know, on the table. And I said, yeah, but if you ask him, of course he'll say yes and then it will buy me a year or two of my life back where uh, he sort of knows what it is I want to do next. And uh, because in traditional Islamic households, you're not allowed to talk to your prospective groom. And I was trying to just get somebody else to advocate for my interests. And uh, at one point, my mother and I are having this standoff. And remember, I've been raised in America. So I take a box from close by. I put five books and one outfit, no toothbrush, and I walk out the door and I say, well, I'm the product, and so you can't make this deal without me. And off I go to the local donut house, hoping to kill an hour of my life and come back. And I thought for sure my mother would cave and we'd be done. She didn't talk to me for like another 10 or 15 years after that moment. Oh my goodness, and really? I, yeah, and I got excised from my family, but it was a really interesting moment in my life about, you know, the hand we're dealt is just that, and then we get to decide from there what is it that we want to claim for ourselves? What is it that matters to us? And how do we assert ourselves into that narrative of our life? And uh, I think one of the reasons why I notice so much power and agency as it belongs to each of us is because I had to make that really tough call super early on in life. And then I noticed the people who are really able to accomplish big things, it's because they were able to assert themselves into the narrative of their own life. So what is the one trait that has kept you on the road to success? It's getting back up and you know because there's so many times when you don't accomplish the thing you want to do day one or day two or even day 15 or 50 but it's figuring out how to just keep trying and persevering and learning I didn't really like math like theoretical math when I was growing up but the first time I understood calculus was when I understood that it was measuring the rate of change and because all calculus is really doing is measuring the slope or the rate of change and once I understood that I thought about my life that way which is if I can just figure out how to learn faster or grow faster, then over time I would outperform anyone else because I was just managing the rate of change. 
So talk to us about the role of co-ownership from a business perspective and how you failed to recognize the importance of this in the workplace while you were at Autodesk. Co-ownership is so important because it means that it's not your idea and I get to execute or my idea and you get to execute, but we come together to understand something together. And once we do that, both of us can run down the field in a way to actually get that ball you know, into the scoring field. And right now, what happens too often is you know, an idea is owned by one party and execution is owned by the other, but the world moves so fast that if I was only responsible for execution, it would mean that I wouldn't know if I had to make trade-off A or trade-off B, which one was right. But if I co-own that idea, then as we go into execution, it'll co I can actually make the right call and I'll help it be successful. What is a value create network that you talk about in chapter one? So the value creation network is simply this. It's what Apple did when they started doing apps on their devices. So I'm old enough to remember when, when our mobile devices really used to have one or two or three apps on it. Mm -hmm. And it was because mobile providers actually chose those. And it was in fact called on-deck applications because they would go through and a developer would spend a million or two million dollars to figure out what to build in it and then they would be chosen. And then Apple came along and actually changed innovation and in how it worked by saying anyone can play in this marketplace of ideas and it let literally tens of thousands of ideas come to bear. And so this is what the, the network is because it's allowing value creation to come from anywhere in the world from that original idea place and then figuring out how to create that marketplace so that there's a way for other people to connect to it. That's what's going to actually, and, and by the way, all the economics work, Apple makes money, the app developer makes money, the consumer gets to participate in this, and it's, it's an ecosystem that's actually viable for all the parties and yet allows a multitude of ideas to come to bear. What does the term in your book, making a dent, mean? And can you share a case study of someone successfully le leveraging this concept? Making a dent is a phrase I really liked. You know, I grew up in tech, literally picking apricots in the orchards that Apple built its first building on. One of my first jobs is at Apple. And so from heritage in tech, making a dent was the way we would say, make a dent in the universe. It was just sort of a very tech term. And uh, people often associate it with Steve Jobs, but it's really just a valley way of referring to things. And so I loved it because dents can be small. And I think all of us have a bit to add to the world. It could be a big bit or a little bit, but we all have something that we can contribute. And so I like the way that Dent captured that sense. And then a story to kind of illustrate it. Uh, there was a story in the book with Alex Hillman. Alex was a young, kind of lost soul in Philadelphia, had finished college and was doing web development at a company and just didn't feel like anyone else in Philadelphia looked and felt like him. And he just felt lonely and feeling like maybe he should leave and move to Silicon Valley. At some point, he, the job he's planning on going to doesn't pan out. And uh, he looks around and he thought, I should give Philly one more shot. And he literally goes to every networking event he can find. He changes what he wears and how he shows up in the world, so from suits to ironic t-shirts and flannel jackets. And he just starts figuring out, who are people like me? And in seeking and signaling those people, he ended up gathering a group of people together who all did web development, who were geeky, who liked making stuff. And they started literally coming like locusts to coffee shops and starting just to work together. And after a while, they kind of looked at each other and thought, could we build something more? And they built the first co-working facility in Philadelphia, now 300 people large. What looked at first like nothing, right? Alex is just simply saying, I want people like me to be able to find one another, um, ends up gathering a community of people together and then making a dent and changing how Philadelphia was able to serve its entrepreneurial community. Because when I talked to the deputy mayor, Rich Green, he said, before we found Indy Hall, we couldn't figure out how to serve entrepreneurs. So what looked at first, I don't know, like invisible to both Alex as well as his community became visible because he claimed that spot in the world only he stood. And then as he pulled on that thread of interest, it led him to the other people and then ultimately led to the creation of a brand new business. And that's what making a dent can be. It's that ability to claim and then find the community and act on it in such a way that you can make something new. What are the biggest roadblocks that hold people back from discovering their onlyness? What do you think? <laughs> Most people are so afraid of being the only one. Mm -hmm. The only one can be lonely. 
And in fact, research done in the 70s by Rosabeth Moss Cantor kind of affirms that. If we're less than 15% of a group, so if you're, let's say, the only woman in a group, a corporate board, I've been a part of a whole bunch of male, white, you know, older boards, and the only woman standing there and thinking, yeah, I am the lonely only. And it's hard because it means actually, it's hard to assert your original ideas in a place you don't feel safe, you don't feel like you can take the risk. And, um, and so onlyness is really this ability to find the other people who, who actually care about the same things as you and then go together into the world. So all that has, social media has made this much more viable for everyone feeling, get, getting this. Yeah, and I think that. that's why we didn't do it before, right? Is we thought, well, if, if I'm, uh, you know, I think there's certainly some people who get rewarded for being original, but a whole bunch of us don't. And so uh, 31%, according to the research I did, actually get to feel like they're in a, it's okay to be original, but the rest of us usually get to feel marginal. And that's why we haven't been able to do it in the past. What do the terms horizontal and vertical identity mean that you discuss in your book? Horizontal and vertical identity is a phrase I actually got from Andrew Solomon, the writer. And he was doing this wonderful job of describing that identity is, is multifaceted, and certainly onlyness is also. And he said vertical identity is the stuff we get from our family. So think uh, socioeconomic, your race, your gender, these are things you get from the family of origin. But he said there's another kind of identity that actually connects you in a much different way, which is horizontal identity, based on what you care about. And so all of a sudden, you could be uh, you know, born in a per certain part of the world based on your family of origin, but then find other people based on your own passion. And that kind of identity can allow us to be more connected in a way that's much more meaningful than, let's say, what school you went to or where you were born. So how can ordinary people discover their onlyness? And can you share an example with us? So I think one of the things that we can all do is figure out what it is we're passionate about. But sometimes we take it for granted, the things that we care about. And our friends can be um, really useful in this way. It's as if we have a light bulb over our head. When we walk in the room, the whole room is that color. Mm -hmm. And so it, but when we walk out, our friends can go, you know, when she was in the room, what really changed or what the topics of conversation were or whatever, and they can reflect back to you, what is it that's always present when you're there? And that can be a nice way of us figuring out that's what is it we care yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And then one of the stories in the book that was really illustrative of that was uh, the story of Kimberly Bryant. She was this wonderful um, engineer who had graduated from Vanderbilt University and went on to serve in engineering loved building things, absolutely loved it. But one of her uh, managers, when uh, she got introduced to her pure set of groups at DuPont, introduced her this way. He said, with Kimberly, we got a twofer. And what he was pointing out was Kimberly's otherness because she was a black woman in tech instead of pointing out all the things that made Kimberly special, right? Like what she loved to code, what she had already built, what kind of right. passion she was. And in, in the process, she she really kind of had this epiphany moment of what it feels like to be discounted and seen through the lens of another instead of what she really wanted. And then skip forward 20 years, her daughter's going to coding camp and she notices her daughter Kai is having the exact same experience of being otherized. And she thinks, oh my gosh, this has got to change. And she literally starts this project around a kitchen table where she gathers up her daughter's friends and um, designs some curriculum and because she loves to code and loves to think about things and borrows some computers and figures out, I'm just going to teach these girls to code so that they can have a passion and be celebrated for who they are. And slowly but surely, that program has since grown to train 10,000 girls to code. That's amazing. It's really amazing. And, and what I love about it is in the naming of the program, when she had to come to that decision point of it was starting to get you know, bigger and bigger, and uh, she was really struggling with the name. And another entrepreneur said to her, well, if what you're doing is teaching black girls to code, why not call it that? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, she had to decide for herself if she was willing to define or rather redefine what the word black can mean for some people. Because for her, she knew what it was. She knew it was beautiful and strong and capable and competent. But sometimes in American society, that is not always how black is viewed. And she had to decide how she would claim that spot in the world only she stood in order to grow what she believed was important. And I think that's the big pivot that we can all do. What is the imposter syndrome and how can we avoid it as, as we're searching for meaning? Imposter syndrome is so much fun, and in fact, I wouldn't have written about it if, um, you know, in audiences, people were like, but I feel like I have imposter syndrome. And I was thinking, how can you have imposter syndrome if you're being yourself, 
right? And most of us, here's the reason why we have imposter syndrome. We feel like sometimes in order to get that spot at the table, we have to be like someone else. And so maybe I think that I need to be like you and actually like start to adopt a certain persona of my colleagues instead of being entirely myself. And then over time, that can be, I don't know, like almost like minor deceptions that grow and grow and grow. And so after a while, we don't, how we're sort of reflecting ourselves in the world isn't the same as we actually are, because somehow who we actually are isn't enough. And so what I remind people is, go back to who you actually are, and when you accept that that is okay, that even the things that make you quirky or weird or odd or strange are actually possibly the very things that are needed for that project, and the very things that will add that original idea, that fresh take, or even that groundbreaking idea. Can you share with us a case study of when you were successfully able to make a dent in the corporate world despite the naysayers you may have encountered? Uh, one of my early jobs at Apple was to run the Apple server channel program. And the way I came into that job was really kind of odd. I was going to lunch and I ran into the general manager of the Americas division and he was, he was literally walking around like this with a spreadsheet in front of his hand. And then when he saw me, he sort of like, sort of made eye contact and I walked over and he said, I have a business here that's $2 million in revenue at 50% gross margin, and every other part of our business is diminishing in gross margin. Do you think you could help me figure out how to grow this $2 million product line? And I had no idea. What a question, bumping into someone <laughs> in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> know, right? But I was like, I was thinking, well, the answer is yes. The answer is surely yes. I'm sure I can help you with this. And actually, I remember walking back with the spreadsheet, just like he'd been holding it, into my boss's office and said, do you know what he's talking about? Because I didn't. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, actually, he's been trying to tag everyone with that project. And everyone's been running because they think it's a dog project. And I was like, hmm, all right, well, I'll take it on and see what I can do. And no one believed it was going to be successful. When I called my other colleagues in other parts of divisions and saying, hey, I just got tasked with this, they're like, oh, I ran away from that. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, this can't be that hard. I'll just see what I can do to help. And at some point, I called every I could think of, started tri triangulating what the issues were, sort of came up with what I thought a proposed solution was, and then presented it to the general manager and all of his leadership team. The business right then was about $2 million, and I thought I could figure out how to double, triple, quadruple that, and I presented what I thought was a coherent plan. And I expected that to be the end. And the general manager said, well, why don't, why don't you lead it? And uh, I thought, and I even said to him in the meeting in front of all these people, I said, well, I've never run sales, so why would you ask me to do it? And I've never run a channel program, so I'm clearly not qualified. He said, actually, you have an idea and you have a real passion around how to solve it. That makes you qualified. And within 18 months, that business had grown from $2 million to $180 million. And in fact, Steve Jobs came back and I had a chance to present in front of him wow. this huge success that had happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was funny because later on I ran into the general manager uh, and I said, hey, you know, how come you ever gave me that project? It just seems like such a weird thing for you to believe in me. And he said, actually, no one else believed in it. So if I hadn't given it to you, everyone else would have caused it to fail. You were the only one who actually expressed an interest. So of course it made sense for me to hand it to you. And I thought, what a wonderful object lesson of leadership today if we could only just really look based on interest and passion and not based on past credentials or degrees or pedigree. It was probably my first example of what this new model of leadership could look like in the social world. And how did it go over with Steve Jobs when you did the presentation? Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get to the Steve Jobs moment. In fact, all my division leaders are all sitting on the side of the room and we're doing this sort of business case for our for our, you know, like each business team comes and kind of presents their business case with the idea, of course, that we want to get more money and be able to stay on to do things. And my team decided that since I just had this big success, I would be the one to present it. Yeah. yeah, and and I stood there in my little navy and tailor suit and, you know, a little bow tie and tried to act so appropriate. And he walks in with his flip flops and jeans and like a ratty old t-shirt and he puts his feet on the desk and he crosses his arms and he's like, you know, and I, so I just went up there like super earnest and tried to present it. And uh, so my first slide shows up and it says something like Apple server channel manager or something because that was about my title. And he says, the channel, fuck the channel, we don't need that. Really? And I was like, uh oh. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking over at my colleagues thinking, uh, somebody know what to do now? <laughs> <laughs> Step up. And they all kind of gave me this little shrug of a look. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 
I thought, okay, I'll just go through the rest of the mm -hmm. business proposal. But it was an interesting moment because he was really challenging how he would be doing things in the future, which I thought was interesting because I'd been looking at research that said that customers wanted to have a closer relationship with vendors. And I was thinking, no, 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 the only way we're actually making money right now is through the channel. So I was trying to figure out how to fortify the channel. And he was looking around the corner a little bit more to say, how do we figure out how to have that intermediary um, relationship cut out so we can actually have that intimacy with the consumer. It was probably the first time where I really had to think more about how to think further out with the data that I was being presented. So that was a valuable lesson, right? It was, of course it was. Now, also, can you share some examples of how people were able to leverage tools like social media to help them find their tribe or their people in order to create this community of like-minded people? Yeah. Um, one of the great stories I got a chance to capture in the book was the story of some young boys who were able to change an entire national organization's policies. So it started off with one young man whose parents were gay, and he was the product of two moms, and he... Um, had to actually have, when he was in the Boy Scouts, actually have, like, when he got awards, the language that they used to describe, you know, your mom and your dad was how they used to describe it. And he used to actually get the language changed so that it would celebrate both of his moms. And he thought, gosh, that's, that's wrong or that's off. But it never struck him that it was about inequity until sort of later on. And at some point he thought, why do I have to hide the fact that my parents are two moms? Why do I have to be the exception? Why can't we celebrate the fact that love comes in all of these other ways? And so he petitioned the Boy Scouts of America to change the discriminatory policies and actually uh, implored Intel and United Postal Service to stop funding them and got $900,000 of money taken away through change.org. These were the little boys doing These this? These were the little boys. So, so writing a petition and having literally hundreds of thousands of people join them on this petition through change.org and being able to create social effect through the network of being able to say, I'm not alone and my youth doesn't limit me from having an idea that can actually change the world. Funny enough, Zach is the person I'm talking about, Zach Wallace, wasn't able to affect change, but he ended up starting an organization on Facebook called Scouts for Equality. And through that, he ended up meeting other boys who were trying to basically fight for the same cause. And slowly but surely, a whole bunch of them started doing petitions and learning from each other and creating this social network that allowed them to, first of all, not feel alone. Second of all, find the other people who said, here's what's working and here's what's not and here's what you can learn from. And third, then to actually champion that cause. So a couple of years into this process, they were able to change a national organization's policies to be inclusive of all boys. How can business executives help their companies by leveraging the overarching themes in your book, which only this shared purpose and community? So first of all, this is a trillion dollar opportunity. One of the things, the scholarship that I did with Rotman University was to say, if we could actually gather a way for more people to contribute their ideas, which is actually a huge, that's where all innovation comes from. We have a trillion dollars in the U.S. alone of upside. And the thing we can do just really easily is figure out how to get more ideas to the table, regardless of age, gender, color, etc. One of the stories that I shared in the book was one of Fold It. Fold It was an online um, application that allowed people to do this really obscure protein folding thing. So things like Alzheimer's can't be solved until you understand how proteins fold, or rather misfold. But it turns out every scientific team was actually having to recreate the wheel. And they just thought, why not actually build a repository of how proteins fold? When they opened this up at first, they thought, we'll get PhDs to do this. And it turns out there weren't enough PhDs. So I thought, gosh, can we actually open it up to anyone, quite possibly everyone? So they got rid of the jargon, they hid the credentials, you know, like so that it wasn't obvious you came from Stanford and I came from Columbia kind of thing, and actually just found a way to turn down the dials of the things that don't matter and turn up the dials of what does, which is can anyone participate without having to know all the jargon and without having to get pre-screened to participate. And in the end, there was a woman who actually turned out to be the very best protein folder in the world. She had gotten a degree um, in nursing early on in her career, but during the day right now, she answered the phone. She was an admin, but she loved puzzle solving, like she was a Sudoku player on a regular basis. And so here she was figuring out how to contribute that which only she could, because Fold It as a system was enabling her to do that. And I think that's really the opportunity for every company, which is if you can figure out how to open up the perimeter of your innovation field to anyone and everyone, how might you actually figure out how to both get the better ideas, 
fresh ideas, and then figure out how to monetize them. Chapter six, you talk about the TED program. Uh, what was your experience like being a TED speaker, and how did this help you scale? Well, you know, I gave a TED talk in, uh, what was it, 2013. And that talk is now in the top 10% of all TED talks. And it regularly referenced, it's changed a meme in society so that people think about sitting as the smoking of our generation was the phrase I had coined, and really advocating for walking meetings. And to this day, I have people on the internet saying, I took a walking meeting today, and it changed. You know how one small action can create a big change? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what that idea really showed me. And so my people criticize TED Talks for, um, you know, for, for being, I don't know, almost too easy to understand. But you can't spread an idea if other people can't latch onto that idea and make it their own. And I think that's what TED really allows a lot of ideas to spread that way. Can you share some examples of individuals or organizations that have been successfully able to attain scalability that you mention in your book? Yeah. So it, you know, one of the great um, things that allows scale to happen is when people can come together around a common problem, and so. Just like we talked about with the folded example a few minutes ago, getting a pool of resources to come together and basically participate collaboratively solving a problem. So an example in the book is also Patients Like Me. Patients Like Me um, was originally for all these obscure diseases like ALS that are considered, I don't know, unsolvable because they're so, they're called orphan diseases sometimes in the medical field because they're sort of too small to invest enough resources on and too hard to do research on because people are scattered. And so one of the things patients like me did is just gathered people together and said, what if we could actually pool our response to medicine, our current, te you know, like here's what I'm taking, here's what symptoms I'm having, and being able to pool those resources online so that research became easier. And they've caused pharmaceutical companies to actually change how they address these supposedly orphan diseases because they've made it easier to make progress. And that's really the power of scaling a whole bunch of people. That happens when you can kind of give of yourself because you care about the larger common purpose. Can you share with us three valuable lessons for success when trying to bring people together for a cause? The greatest things that we can do today is to figure out how to drive more collaborative systems. So collaborative systems are ways in which people can share an idea as their own. They don't do that unless they trust one another to actually say, I'm willing to share my idea with you because I trust how it will be treated. Whether or not they're willing to believe they will be beneficial, like they get a benefit out of it. So if it's just a one-way transaction, people are less willing to give. But if they say, oh, when I give, someone else will benefit or I will somehow benefit again in the larger cause. And then the third thing is, They'll, they'll do it if they believe you have the same shared interest as I do. So if a leader will take advantage of you and your time, but not actually give you back something in return, you're less likely to follow that leader. And so that ability for, that, you, know, for you to believe the leader has your interests also at heart is what allows you to give. Okay, some movements. Let's talk about Occupy Wall Street. You talk about that in your book. Were they successful? And if they were not successful, why not? What happened with them? Well, I'm quite critical of Occupy Wall Street in the book, and the reason is they didn't actually accomplish anything. Uh, the issues of pay inequity between CEOs and the common uh, workmen was well known before Occupy. Uh, in fact, hasn't changed at all in many years. And so then when it actually came to what did they actually accomplish, I think what they did is generate more resentment but they didn't actually create any new solutions. And so I measure success, being an operating person, did you actually do something with all that activity? Did you move the ball further down the field so that we might ultimately get to progress? Other end of the spectrum, Black Lives Matter. What made that movement successful and how were they able to galvanize people and make a dent? So the Black Lives Matter movement was, was something really interesting. It turns out that when Barack Obama was elected in the United States, the number of people who thought that there was a racial problem in America, that racism was a problem, uh, was exactly the same number as there were black people in America. It was about 12.3% uh, black people in America and 13% of Americans thought that racism was a problem, which would suggest that those with the lived experience were actually understanding of it, but the rest of the people didn't really have a clue. Um, that number is now in the high 60s. And that is largely as a result of the ability to find the issues that African Americans face, especially as it relates to the criminal justice system, that they are 
um, followed at much higher rates, uh, therefore have more potential to um, get arrested, and then are treated in a way um, that is uh, unfair in the balance of systems as to you know their role in the justice system. And because we've seen so many videos and and research all tagged the same common theme of Black Lives Matter, we can now start to see a through line through the stories that we who may not have the lived experience of being black can go, oh, there is something here that needs addressing so that this notion of justice that America really believes in can actually be something we do. Can you share with us an example of an organization that was able to address a complex situation by leveraging the idea of shared purpose and trust among its employees, even if others thought the idea was too wild? When patients like me first formulated, one of the struggles they had was why would people be willing to give of their data, so all their essentially personal information, why would they give that data up for an organization that was ultimately going to charge for it and try to do something you know, monetarily with it. And what they came back to is people are willing to do a lot if they believe that the purpose that they, that they hold in common with an organization is important to that organization too. So in the case of patients like me, what they were saying was, give me your data and I will figure out how to actually change how the pharmaceutical industry addresses this disease and in return, basically help this disease get you know, conquered. That's a pretty big promise, but they were able to basically deliver on it because they kind of at all times added transparency into the system and said, here's what we're planning on doing with your data. And then I talked to this lovely um, uh, guy who uh, characterized this story beautifully. His name was Ed Sickoff. And Ed had uh, Parkinson's disease. And he said, every day I come and I check the site right after I do my email, this is the first site I come into and I check in with all my data even though my own disease is in remission. And I was like, why would you do that? And he said, because if all my information could help Parkinson's go away, mm -hmm. then all this will not be for naught. My own suffering will be for naught. And I think that's how most people feel about the organizational work that we do. We're more than willing to give of ourselves if we believe in what the other people are also doing to help the larger cause come to, you know, come to fruition. Okay, in chapter eight, you discuss how we must come together to do the hard things so we can learn the new things. Explain how this concept was embraced by the 100K in 10 initiative that you talk about in the book that helped train teachers in STEM. Talia Milgram Elcott was the uh, leader and uh, of this organization called 100K in 10, which is aimed at training 100,000 teachers in 10 years, which had never been done before. And in fact, when she first got the charter uh, to start doing it, she was thinking even 10,000 teachers was a lot. And so here she is with this mammoth task. And at first she started doing it the way you and I might both do it, which is how do I gather enough resources, work really hard. And a couple of years into the effort, she realized actually, even if I train 100,000 teachers and kind of get them into the system, they could just as easily kind of flesh out mm -hmm. of the system. And she thought, this is wrong. Like, I'm not actually fixing the real problem, even though I you know, could do the one part of it right. And she thought, should I tell people or not? Should I ask people to actually look at that issue? Because it would be expanding the scope of what they took on. And she took the courage to trust the people she was working with and say, you know, it seems to me we're missing something here because if we fix one part of education but don't fix the other parts of education, we may not actually get to our end goal. And that whole group of 300 plus collective people who were involved said, well then what do we do? Mm -hmm. And they started this journey of discovery together that was really coming at it not from a problem, problem solving perspective of we work harder, but let's even figure out how we reimagine the problem. Let's even figure out what is it we could pilot. Let's even figure out what questions have we not asked. And it was essentially what she was doing in this context of leadership was setting up learning and trusting that people were gonna be okay learning together. And it seems to me like a lot of the simple problems that we have today are solved or can be solved through automation. The things that are left are complex problems that require the multiplicity of all of our talents or what I call onlyness, mm -hmm. and then coming together to bear on that problem so we can solve it together. And Talia did it by saying, I will trust us to hold a brand new question together so that we might even find the solutions together. What advice would you give to ordinary people who feel that they don't have the right credentials or education or background uh, to make a dent for a better future? 
You know, the one thing that we all have to get through is that we all have the ability to make a difference. Uh, the question is, how do we find the other people who care about the same things as us? So, in, in fact, uh, one of the stories I shared in the book was the story of my husband, who uh, crystallized something for me that I had been looking at in the innovation world, but all of a sudden when I saw it up close and personal with him, I realized, oh my gosh, this is the big shift. So, uh, Kurt had come to me and said, you know, he would love to get a PhD and to do something to solve world peace. That was about as much as he could say. And because uh, that was about as fuzzy as the idea was for him. And I, I had already put my first husband through law school and I was so uninterested <laughs> in putting my next husband. Yeah, it's like, mm -mm. And, uh, but I didn't say that because I you know, didn't want to dampen his spirit. But I was like, well, is there any other way you could start this? And it turns out our career coach basically asked him the same thing, which is, is there any way you could start that without getting a PhD? Start small. And he did. And he started doing this thing where he formed a blog, and I think he called himself a neophyte humanitarian. That was his blog. And he just started writing like what he thought was possible. And at the time, I think his two grown daughters were reading it, and maybe like one other person. Like it was, you know, basically what looked like nobody. And a couple months into it, he didn't stop. He just kept going until somebody actually ended up saying, you know, this blog that you've started is really interesting. There's a guy over here who's about two months further along who has something really similar. You guys should talk. And it digitally connected them. And they started having an exchange and they realized they had really similar goals. But until that first person started their effort, the other connection couldn't be made. And notice that my husband didn't give, he didn't say, gosh, I need permission or I need money. He just got up one hour earlier a day, a couple times a week. He started doing something in the absence of knowing how it would end up. And he simply started acting on his passion. Were you helping him along with this or he just, this was something? This was something he was doing and I was watching it in the innovation field happen in such a different way, but watching it personally kind of brought it home how many of us can simply by small actions start to move towards really big goals. And that, that foundation, what, what's now a 501c3 foundation, Apropedia, is actually one of the largest sites for appropriate technology to create world-solving problems. So creating safer playgrounds in a major city or clean stove tops in Sudan. Uh, there are all these really interesting projects that they documented in showing how to do uh, use local resources to solve real life problems. And I'm fascinated by it because it seems like all of us could do that, figure out that thing that we care about. And then in small ways, for, that's why I love the phrase a dent, um, all of us could find a way to make our one little bit make a difference. So what's gonna be your next dent on society? Well, I think onlyness is a really big idea and I wanna see it go out in the world uh, so, that, so that every single one of us can figure out how to tap into our own passions. Uh, we can figure out how to use, um, you know, build the communities we need in order to get things done. And then I think there's a really interesting economic opportunity. How do businesses start to unlock onlyness? How do we figure out how to build our economy so that we're driven from this place? Not jobs and boxes and things that can be commoditized and um, put into small functions, but actually enabling all the creativity that each of us have and bringing that forth into our world. Nilifer, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Good luck with your new book. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of Sartor TV. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new today. Until next time, I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Thanks for watching.